What's up everybody, sysadmin Sean here, and today I'm gonna to be talking about HPC, kind of what the basics are of an HPC cluster, as well as some of the software options and kind of give you a broad overview of HPC. So let's get right into it. So this is kind of, I'm gonna use draw IO for this. This is how we're gonna lay out this entire concept of what HPC looks like from a logical standpoint. This isn't a network diagram, any sort of like really in-depth thing. We're going pretty simple here. So basically, HPC, HPC stands for high performance computing. Um, you cluster a large number of compute and storage together, and then you run scientific software on it. So a lot of big places have HPC clusters, a lot of Universities all over the world have HPC clusters. And then as we're moving along in the HPC universe, uh, we're getting into quantum computing in the HPC realm, which is really, really cool, but way outside the scope of this video. So the basics for what could be considered an HPC setup is really simple. First, you're gonna get a head node or a login node or a head node and a login node. That's all depending on what you wanna do. So, but this is it, this is your head node. And that is the brains of the function. It handles distribution, accounts, user accounts, job scheduling management. A lot of management software is installed on the head node to manage everything else on the system. So then you'll get a, let's put in a network switch right here, just for the sake of, of argument, we'll make it a little flat like that, right? And the head node connects into the network switch, obviously. And then let's throw in a bunch of rectangles. So we'll do, I don't know, maybe four. Make it look cool here. Boom, 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 boom. And these are our compute nodes. So we'll call these node 01, node 02, node 03, and node 04. So these con compute nodes all connect into this switch. So we'll connect them real quick. And then of course the head node connects into that switch as well. So that's your basic IO layout. Let's zoom in a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better. So you've got your head node that goes into a network switch and then you have your compute nodes that go into this network switch. And then you probably have, oh, let's use the cylinder to represent storage. You're probably gonna have some sort of network attached storage. So we'll go ahead and attach it to the network, bloop. Uh, sometimes this could be mounted onto the head node, but we'll just call it network mounted storage. And that is where you store input files, output files, job data, all of that. And this storage is obviously accessible to all the nodes, accessible to the head node, and users can mount directories, install software, and things like that. The workflow would be that a user will connect to the head node slash login node. I'm going to put a slash login node here. So it's a little bit clear. They sign in and authenticate. That gives them access to utilize all of this compute. Now they can utilize it in a couple of different ways. You can either have a job scheduler, such as Slurm. Can we just type in this? Is this gonna be, here we go. So this would also be on the head node, but manage the compute nodes. So something like Slurm or PBS is one or I believe there's one called SunGuard. No, not SunGuard. Uh, Condor, HTC Condor, I believe is also one. I can't remember if it's HT Condor or HTC Condor, but we use Slurm uh, where I'm at. I use Slurm on all of my clusters. We have six or so clusters that I manage and they all use Slurm. This allows for distributed computing. Uh, and we'll go into probably videos based on each one of these pieces of software, at least from a general level. Researcher takes their data, says, I need to write, I need all of these compute nodes to solve this equation for me. And so they'll write up a little batch script, essentially, that calls the data, calls the software they want to run, and then runs the software on each of the compute nodes. If they need all four, or if they just need one, they'll run it on one. It will generate the data, store the data in the network storage and make that output available. And the Slurm will then let the user know that their job is completed or that it failed or it hit a checkpoint and stopped or something along those lines. There's lots of different things that can happen. So that's kind of the basics of how HPC operate, operates. Now, of course, you can do this in the cloud. You can do this on-prem. You can do this virtually if you want to. Uh, though virtually is, is a little bit difficult. Um, the pieces you can virtualize, uh, definitely the head node, login node, because you could separate a lot of those services. Um, you could virtualize an access gateway to allow people into the cluster. Uh, there are projects like 
uh, open on demand that give you access to the cluster without having to worry about SSHing and SSH keys and things like that. And yeah, you can also handle certain graphical interface jobs and things of that nature on here. So that's kind of the basics of what an HPC cluster is. Now, how do you configure one of these clusters? Well, there are two pieces of software that I use on a frequent basis, and that is Bright Cluster Manager and Open HPC. There are other options. Uh, some are still in production. Some are slightly out of production. There was XCAT. There was ROX. Don't use this. <laughs> Rocks is not pleasant. Uh, if you like it, cool, but it's not my jam. And these are the main ones that I know of completely. Uh, again, I use Bright and OpenHPC. Bright Cluster Manager is currently owned by NVIDIA. Uh, it's a really neat piece of software, and you can even get a free license, or at least you, you could as of the last time I checked, for, I believe, a head node and nine compute nodes or eight compute nodes. I can't remember... Exactly, but it's a small amount, but it's still a good amount to learn. And it's graphic user interface via a web, you know, a web service. So you log into the web page, you configure stuff like your networking, your management networking, you, the ISO images you want to use for your compute nodes, the configuration files you want to dump to the compute nodes, your user management, your slurm management, tons of different things are available in Bright Cluster Manager. But when you get into bigger situations, there is a fee. The last time I checked, it was $300 per node per year. So this cluster right here would cost $1,200 a year, and it's only four nodes. Most clusters are hundreds of nodes for the really, really big ones. Mine said in the 20 to 50 node range, so not that big. For those, I use OpenHPC. OpenHPC is a free, it's a repo more than anything. Now they do offer their own packages and some people like them, some people don't like them because they don't stay as up to date as the main release. Like OpenHPC maintains a version of Slurm that they say will work with their system. But regular Slurm is usually a, a little bit ahead of that. And that version of Slurm does get used by Bright Cluster Manager, I believe. But they also have their own repo for certain other Bright management pieces. But these these uh, these software allow you to provision the compute, install the ISOs and stuff like that, because you will basically be pixie booting off of your head node and installing the software on all the nodes so that they match within reason, depending on what types of nodes you have. Maintaining NFS mount points, copying stuff like if, if you're running stateful nodes, which means that you have everything installed on the nodes and it's on a local disk, then it will do stuff like copy home directories to all of them so that it matches between, or, you know, mounts an NFS share for the home directories, which makes a lot more sense. It will copy configurations to those ISOs once they've been provisioned. Or if you're running stateless, it will make sure that the ISO has everything that it needs. So when the node boots, it's done. It starts the services you need and it's completed and it has its networking. On top of all of that, so... OpenHPC uses Werewolf to do a lot of that. There are obviously plenty of other ways that you could pixie boot. You can throw Ansible into the mix here. You can throw Puppet into the mix here. You can throw Terraform into the mix here if you want to. There are tons of extra options to tie in here. The next piece of equipment that a lot of clusters use is called SPAC, and that is Scientific Software Management. There are lots of other software pieces that do this. Um, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but SPAC is the big one that I use. It's like having yum install or apt get install, but only for scientific software. So if if a professor, if a researcher comes up to me and says, hey, I need this version of OpenMPI specifically, and I need it to do these things, then I can go SPAC install OpenMPI, and I can even flag what stuff I need it to compile, because what it does is it will go out if you don't have a local version that you keep available, a local copy of like the Git repo or something like that, it will go out to what it knows as the Git repo based off of user managed recipes. Sometimes the software does it, but usually it's people that use the software that manage recipes and offer up changes and say, hey, there's a new version of this. Here's the change for the file. Put it into the new Slack. Goes out to the repo or the download site, wherever it needs to go to get the source code, pulls it down, references your flags. So maybe I need it to do... Uh, InfiniBand, or maybe I need it to do certain other things, or maybe I need it to implement a different compiler. I put all those flags in, it goes out, it compiles the software the way I want it to be compiled, and then it installs it as a version in the list. And then 
I can call SPAC when I'm a, well, with another package called LMOD, and I believe there are other things. You then get what's called modules. SPAC installs stuff into modules. These module files are kind of like starting software up when you need it and turning it off when you don't need it. So you don't have a bunch of software clogging up the entire system all the time and people's user environments and things of that nature. They'll get a clean, simple login. They pull in the modules they need, do the work they need to do, and then they'll probably purge those modules and clear them out from their user environment in case they need to change the jobs they need to run. So maybe sometimes they need to use one version of OpenMPI, other times they need to use another version of OpenMPI. They can change and swap really easily without having to modify a bunch of file parameters or have a bunch of different scripts set up to load and unload different versions of software. It's really cool. That's how you manage the software for a cluster, or at least how I do it. There are other ways to do it. You can still install everything locally and do it manually. There are software packages that you will have to do manually because of licensing requirements and how you access the, the software. Some people have written SPAC recipes for those pieces of software, you just need to offer up information about your licensing environment and your software package, and then it will do the rest for you, which is pretty nice, but doesn't always work 100% of the time. And that's the basics of what an HPC cluster is and what it does. Probably what we will do in the next video in relation to this series specifically is we will build an HPC cluster using virtual machines. So it will be very small and very weak. We'll start with the head node. We'll design that head node. We'll begin installing OpenHPC so you can see how that works. We will stand up some compute nodes, probably with an Ansible playbook or with Terraform, but probably Ansible. We will then configure OpenHPC on how we want it to use Werewolf to provision those nodes, basically what image we want to install on it, what software we want pre-installed on it, how we wanna handle user authentication, such as do you wanna just have local accounts and copy files like Etsy Shadow, Etsy Password, things, Etsy Groups? Do we want to in include some sort of Active Directory or LDAP type login information? Then we will install stuff such as SPAC and Open On Demand and Slurm, and we'll lay out the entire process from start to finish so you can get a basic idea. Now that will kind of limit all of what you have to do if this is a physical environment, because when you get into a physical HPC environment, there's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot more networking that's involved. So you usually have a remote management network, a regular network, and an InfiniBand network. Now InfiniBand is just a fancy 100 gig twin X network run by Mellanox, AKA owned by NVIDIA. So you purchase nice, fancy Mellanox cables. You have an InfiniBand switch. You mount all this stuff up. You use an InfiniBand connection, and that's what does all the traversal for your scientific jobs. You don't usually use your 1 gig or 10 gig basic networking for any of that. That's too slow. If you're needing to write to storage and these are really big jobs and huge data sets, you need to be able to write really fast and have super low latency. And then same between if you're using multiple nodes to handle one job, they need to be able to communicate at the lowest latency possible. And one of the ways to do that is through InfiniBand. Um, there are other options, but they aren't as well known. This is the basics. This is the high level. This is how HPC works. If you're interested in more about this, let me know. And we'll cover more of this. I do plan to cover more of this. And I still have a bunch of other videos in the pipeline that I'm trying to work on. But I've just gotten some good news. Yay. And but it might mean I slow down even more on videos. I'll have to find out in the coming weeks, but we'll get there. But thanks again for, for tuning in for this video and we'll see you in the next one.